Welcome back to my series on chess opening theory. In this video, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the move 7 rook b1 sideline in the Vinever variation of the French defense. So the French defense is when we have the moves e4, e6, d4, d5. And the Vinever is when white now plays knight to c3. Black plays bishop to b4, and the main line continues with the moves e5, c5, a3, bishop takes c3 check, b c3, knight e7, staying flexible and waiting for white's next move. And now the move we're going to be looking at today is when white plays rook to b1. And to quote uh, the great chess scholar Gotham Chess. Rook b1, rook b1, what the heck is this move? Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, that, that about sums it up in terms of uh, in terms of how challenging this move is for black, because this is not actually a challenging move for black to deal with in the Vinever. Uh, it um, will often be played by players who are either going for some kind of move ward or trick with, you know, one of the more popular 7th moves, or by a player who might not actually know that much opening theory, who might not really be studying, you know, that many books, or, you know, might not have grabbed any books on the Vinever and, you know, looked at all these recent games and all this kind of stuff. Uh, like, White was actually a player who was... Pretty well known for not uh, looking at a whole lot of theory and is known for being very creative in this particular case. And so, basically, the reason why Rook B1 is not a challenging move is because it actually gives Black a number of options. Black has a number of good ways of dealing with this move. Probably the most fun and interesting way for Black to deal with it is to play Queen to A5. Immediately putting pressure on c3 pawn, having a direct threat over here. If white defends it with a move like bishop to d2, then play pawn to b6 with the idea of bishop to a6. And if white goes pawn to c4, for example, you should double check with an engine that this is correct, but in the a4 line, kind of similar stuff. You just play queen a4 and you're totally fine, and this is just very plus position for black. So white generally should not play c4 here. But overall, queen a5 is very interesting, and one possible way that things could continue is with bishop to b5 check. You know, to stop the bishop a6 idea, bishop d7, as we've seen in other lines. If white plays bishop to d3, we can play pawn to c4. After moving the bishop again... Play knight bc6, and then just castle queenside, and it'll be kind of like the positional variation, you know, with move 7, knight to f3, except white played rook b1 instead of knight to f3, and overall, black is doing just fine here. Like, black somehow got their queen over here, where it might be doing something useful. Black probably wants to move this knight away at some point, just so that... If the queen does take the pawn on a3, it can escape to the e7 square, or, you know, some stuff like that. But overall, I think this is a cool way for black to play, but the reason why I did not uh, feature a game that has this line in it is because this line has never been played before. This queen a5 idea against rook b1 has never been played, never been tried, because rook b1 is very, very rare. Now, another approach that black could take here is to play pawn to b6. Now, the reason why pawn to b6 isn't so great for us, like for anyone who's been following my series, is because white could then play queen to g4, and we can't react to queen to g4 the way that we normally would, you know, with the queen on c7 and playing c takes d4, because we did not put our queen on c7. But this position is still okay, like, if you like playing the uh, other main response to queen g4, like, you know, castling or playing king to f8, then this is fine. You could still do that. But um, 
Uh, basically, since uh, since anyone who's been following the series, and since myself, since we both like the Queen C7, C takes D4 response to Queen G4, or that is a decent option. We would much prefer playing Queen C7 over Pawn to B6, just so that if White plays Queen to G4, we can react with C D4. You know, play our typical stuff, C D4, and if Queen comes here, here, Rook comes here, Queen comes here, and then, you know, oh take some stuff here. I, if I recall correctly, Queen takes E5, check is the correct way to continue here, just win both pawns. Yeah, that's most intuitive, just take, take, and then take. Like, I might cover this particular sideline on move 10, where white has played rook b1, just to stop queen takes c3 stuff. Uh, but, um, uh, basically, uh, this black is totally fine here. Like, this is just kind of a different sideline at this point. This is more like a move 10 sideline instead of a move 7 sideline. But basically, this is why queen to c7 is preferred by us over pawn to b6. It's so that we can do this against queen to g4. We can stay within familiar territory. Alright, but in the game we're going to be covering today, white did not play queen to g4, even though if white knew... Vinifer theory, they probably would actually play queen to g4 on move 7 and play the most challenging stuff and play very aggressively. But in the game we're going to be covering today, white played knight to f3. And before continuing, I thought that I should just introduce the players. So with the white pieces, we have international master Emery Tate, who has been called by Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. He has been referred to as a, a real trailblazer among African-American chess players. He is um, very well known for his very uh, sharp attacking style, for playing very aggressive, very fun fighting chess, and also for his lectures, which um, unfortunately I don't have any recordings of since um, it's probably before, you know, the internet age and all that, as where he would, you know, talk about his games and talk about all these crazy, really cool lines that he saw and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, he's uh, no longer with us. He was kind of a player from a previous generation who... Um, uh, like, kind of from before the days of engines and opening theory getting really, uh, uh, really, really advanced. And it's like, even when engines, uh, did come out, like, according to White's son, Andrew Tate, yes, that Andrew Tate, the, uh, social media personality, that, that guy, according to him, he, uh, White did not really enjoy... Engines. He like just did not like engines very much. Pro probably for a similar reason why Fisher did not like engines. They kind of take some of the fun out of the game. And, but anyway, White is a just a very fun player, and hopefully I'll have White featured in uh, the series more often. Like maybe if I cover the King's Gambit, I wonder if White's the kind of player who would play that. At. But anyway, overall very fun player, and even though White lost this game. It's still a very, very cool game. Like, I originally, uh, I originally considered, uh, not covering Rook B1 at all, but when I saw this game, I was like, okay, this game's actually really fun, and White's just a very interesting player to talk about, so why not? Why not include this game in the series? And with the black pieces, we have Grandmaster Yuri Shulman, who has been featured in the series series before, like he's also a very strong American player. Uh, Grandmaster Shulman was originally from Belarus, and he uh, in the past was the Belarus national champion, and also the European junior champ champion, and um, I think he was the uh, US national champion in 2008, and he tied for first in the, uh, I think the tournament's called the U.S. National Open, 
in 2010 and 2011 as well, but lost in the playoff to Gatacomsky. And aside from that, uh, Black has also uh, has started two charities related to chess. The Yuri Shulman uh, International Chess School, as well as Chess Without Borders. So I think previously I provided, provided a link to uh, Black's Wikipedia page, so I think this time I will provide a link to Black's official website. And uh, this particular game took place at the Foxwoods Open, and more information about the players and the events can be found in the video description. And now, back to the game. So in this position, White has played Knight to F3, which is a bit of an interesting choice, because Knight to F3 is generally known as the positional variation, like if you play it on move 7. And so Black decided to play Pawn to B6, with the typical idea in the Knight F3 line of just trying to trade off the light square bishop. Now normally here, the idea for White is to go bishop to b5 check, and then black goes bishop to d7, and then the bishop retreats. But in this case, white decided to play bishop d3 like this. Maybe not familiar with uh, the theoretical idea of playing bishop to a6, but that's fine. So black played bishop to a6. White now castled. Black played h6. You know, basically taking away this square from... The knight and the bishop. The knight in particular could get very annoying if it came to g5. So white now played bishop to e3. Black now traded on d3. And white took back with the pawn, which was pretty interesting. Like, basically taking towards the center and fighting for more central control. But um, there kind of is a downside to taking back with the pawn. Although the engine doesn't actually hate it that much. The downside is just that um, it allows black to open up the C file. Basically, black plays C4 and gets ready to trade away these pawns over here. And when white does this trade, like when we have the trade, the C file opens up. And now this pawn on C3 is very weak. Now, white could defend the C3 pawn. On, but the c3 pawn is very easy for black to attack. It is what you would call a backwards pawn because um, its friends and are kind of you know further away. They're further forward, so this guy's stuck at the back defending them and can't be defended by pawns itself. So it's basically a target for black to attack. So white could you know bring their pieces back and play defense and you know try to save this pawn, but that's just not the kind of player that White is. White likes playing aggressive, fun chess, remember? So White played knight to d2 and was like, yeah, go ahead, take that pawn. I'm not too worried. So Black took the pawn, and, you know, things aren't too scary for White at the moment. Like, in the long run, White does have to worry about Black making a pass pawn on over here on the queen side in the end game but that's in the end game white still has time to maybe try to launch an attack maybe use this c file you know, to get very aggressive and launch an attack on black so here white plays queen to g4 which is a move that actually has some interesting tricks behind it it's, now, what's funny is that here, black actually can castle. In the game, black played rook to g8, which is fine. But what's funny is that, according to the engine, castling is fine, even though this looks very scary. Like, white could take like this, but then black could play knights to here, protecting here, and then if white goes back like this, black could take this important central pawn. So black could have castled, but... Um, it's kind of a scary thing to do, like giving up this pawn over here, especially, especially against a player who's going to attack you, a player who's going to get very aggressive. Like, maybe at some point, like, get this knight away from there and try to do some scary stuff with rook b3 and try to swing this rook over. Like, you know, that kind of looks a little scary. I'm not too sure about that. 
that so basically in this position black played rook to g8 now you might be wondering well why not you know play knight to f5 or knight to g3 now or knight to g6 i should say but the problem with knight to g6 is that um white can actually just play like rook fc1 for example i should make sure i place the right rook yeah rook fc1 is fine like an entire book can be written about putting the wrong rook on the right square. Like, rook here, and then if here, come in like this, and king comes out, and then take, and then take, and then, you know, uh, like, the engine says this is okay, that this is somewhat playable, but I'd be pretty scared here. <laughs> you know, the king dancing out with... You know, still a queen and a rook left on the board. And this knight looks very silly over here. And this pawn's probably going to be lost. Like, I would not be happy with this if I were black. So, as a result, in this position, with queen g4, castling kingside is possible. But it looks a little risky with losing the h-pawn. And so, black went for rook to g8. Like, white is very well known for their wild attacks, for finding all these crazy tactical sequences. So black decided to just play it safe. The downside of this, of course, is that it does kind of tie up this knight a little, and it also removes the ability of the castle king side. The reason why the knight is a little tied up is because, you know, the bishop might be able to take here. Like, I suppose if the knight goes to one of these two squares, it's not so bad. Ah, anyway, so after rook to g8, white made one move that the engine didn't like. White played queen to e2. Instead, the move that uh, the engine prefers is rook fc1, and I actually do kind of agree with the engine. Like, one mistake that attacking players often make when they're launching an attack is they often forget to use all their pieces. Like, they'll often have one piece not be participating, but chess is a team sport. You kind of want to have all of your players participating if possible. So white played queen to e2. Basically figuring, well, the queen kind of did its job on g4. It kind of provoked, you know, a little bit of a concession by black here of, you know, giving up castling right. So white decided to put their queen back here. But rook fc1 would have been a bit more accurate since, um, you know, you get the rook out with tempo, and it's like, hey, you gave up your c3 e pawn, you might as well, you know, grab the associated compensation with it. You might as well grab this very nice file over here. Here, maybe this will enable some nice ideas with bishop takes h6 later on, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, that's not what happened in the game. We have queen to e2. We have queen to a5. I forget why capturing the a pawn was bad. I should take a quick look at that. That's, I guess why eight just gets too much play on these files and kind of ties up the rook. Yeah, and the queen can come to b5 with check as well. So, okay, that's the reason. Reason, that's the reason. It's not so good. Like, I guess a sample line, like rook here. Queen back. Now bring the rook out. White's kind of getting too much compensation here with all these open files. Black's pieces are kind of just stuck where they are. And then, ooh, this looks a little nasty, actually. Some ideas of maybe queen coming in here and then rook there and then boom. <laughs> Stuff like that. That, anyway, it's not what happened in the game. Instead... We have queen e2, black's playing it safe, black plays queen a5, we have f4, queen a6, black's like, you know what, my king's kind of stuck in the center for a bit, we've got an open file here that makes castling queenside a little unattractive, how about I? How about we just trade queens and go for an endgame where I can, you know, use these guys? And White's like, no, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to do that. No. 
And Black's like, okay, I'll just develop my pieces then. And White played Bishop to F2. Probably to defend this guy. I, I forget the reason why. Like, now the knight, now that the knight is here, things are kind of a little bit less tied up over here with the defense of this guy. Like, Black is catching up in development. So, additional pawn sacrifices might be harder to justify. So, we have Bishop to F2, a fine move. Rook to c8. Black's like, well, if white's not going to take this open file, I think I'll take it for myself because this file looks great. White goes on the offensive with g4. Black plays g6 because black's king is not on g8, so g6 isn't really weakening the king too much, although it is weakening this square a little. Maybe white can try getting in here with bishop h4, you know, that kind of fun stuff. But white instead decides to improve the safety of their king, as well as potentially open up the g1 square for the rook. You know, if black's king does end up going over here. But black's king is like, nope, I'm running this way. I'm running to the queen side. We have king to d7. We have pawn to a4. Or white's basically throwing their pawn forward. Throwing it away, being like, yeah, go ahead, take it now. I dare you. I want things to open up on the queen side now that your king's going there. We have queen takes a4, rook to a1, queen to c2. And now in this position, white played queen to e3, which um, was a bit inaccurate. The engine prefers queen to e2. Ooh, and I think the reason why is because black is eventually going to be playing knight to c4. And the knight coming with a tempo on the queen might be bad. That tempo might be actually be very important. important. And, like, of course, black does have to watch this guy over here. Black really does not want to allow the rook to come in like that. But, um, apparently queen to e2 was more accurate, but, um... I don't really know why, if I had to guess, it's just because when a knight arrives on c4, it will be hitting the queen with tempo. So black played knight to a5, white played rook to a3, black played queen to b2, getting ready to, uh, uh, what's it called, meet any rook b1 ideas with, you know, rook to uh, c1 with check. So... White's like, ah, I see that. I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to let not let that be check. So white plays bishop to g1. Black plays rook to c7. White now plays rook to f2, basically figuring, well, if, uh, you know, if uh, the uh, rook on b1 is not going to be so good, maybe I'll try rook to f2 instead. Try to get in like this. This, you know, maybe threaten some nasty things with uh, knight to c4. Although that wouldn't really work, actually, since the knight can take and then take... Yeah, silly me. I'm being a little silly here. Anyway. Rook to f2. Queen to b4. Queen to d3. Rook gc8. White breaks through with f5. This was probably another reason for keeping the rook here, as opposed to... Uh, Putting it on, like, moving it to b1 or something. Something like, keep it here since the king is still kind of in the center as opposed to fully on the queen side. So it's kind of trying to force the issue by playing f5. Black plays gf5. White plays gf5. Black plays knight takes f5. And it's like, I don't get the point. Why'd you sacrifice a pawn? And it's like, I'm not sacrificing a pawn. I'm sacrificing the exchange. So rook takes f5, pawn takes f5, even though the engine might hate this, you know, like a weaker player, you know, a player who is not a grandmaster might be pretty scared of playing this with black. You know, they might be a little scared of, you know, an exchange sacrifice ice manifesting and then, and, you know, like basically pressing on further with this attack. But black is a grandmaster and can defend very, very well. That's part of what separates, you know, grandmasters from the rest of us. It's not that they're 
necessarily the best attackers is that their defending abilities are also really really good so we have king to c6 we have rook to d3 because the rook was you know queen was threatening it it was on free so king to b7 black is just trying to get their king to safety basically the king is going to try to hide in a bunker and try to wait for know all the pieces to get traded so that black can just win in the end game white plays queen to f3 getting on this nasty diagonal and attacking the pawn we have queen to b5 knight to f1 maybe do this at some point although not now because of the rook don't want to lose that guy black's like yeah i'm a little bit scared of my King being on this diagonal. So black's like king to a6. Let's do that. And then white plays rook to a3. Trying to still get all super menacing. But black's like, aha, you have overextended rook to c1. And now, now everything kind of comes together. We see the true points of everything. Black's king is safe, and now it's white who is in a lot of danger. Now white is the one who should be scared. Because, basically in this position, there isn't really any good move for white. Like, white's uh, knight is under attack, and there isn't a nice way of defending it. Like, if king g2, you just, like, bring the other rook in and attack like that. Bishop to dare, you just take the knight for free. You know, stuff, stuff of that nature. Nature. So, basically, it kind of looks like white has to move the knight. Like, if I recall correctly, like, top engine move was like knight d2 or something. But even that's still not all that great. I think if knight d2, then... And, oh, actually, top, top move is actually rook d3 block this way. But this doesn't even really all doesn't really work all that much since queen b1 still applies a lot of pressure and um basically the knight will be lost and stuff like there are tricks with queen d2 trying to do some stuff over here with the rook but black can just very calmly play rook 8 c4 and um basically things are not looking good for white here like Basically, black is going to play this and then this. Like, kick the queen away and then triple up and then eat everything. So, that's one way that the game could have ended. But instead, what happened was white played knight to e3. Which, um, you know, might not be the top engine move, but it's a very human move. Very reasonable move. And um, white immediately resigned. And... Um, I'm kind of disappointed. I kind of feel that white should have let uh, black play out the combination that's possible here. here Because it is very nice. It is a very cool little combination. If you want, you can pause the video and try to figure out how should black continue. How can black finish off white here, here in this position. Because it's actually... Pretty geometrically pleasing little combination. Very forcing sequence that Black Black could play that would kind of end the game almost immediately. So I will reveal the answer in three, two, one. So the idea, the reason why White resigned is because Black can play the move Queen to B1 and basically threaten both this bishop and also checkmate if rook takes bishop that's kind of checkmate so white has to deal with that white has to deal with the fact that uh black is not just threatening material but is also threatening checkmate so if white tries defending the bishop with the only piece that can like only the queen can defend the bishop so with a move like queen f2 for example it doesn't actually matter which uh move you defend like where the queen goes it doesn't matter you just take after queen takes, rook to c1, and once again, black is threatening not just 
the queen, but black is also threatening checkmate, so white has to do something about this. Like, if you block with the knight, you just take the knight. That's, that's no good. Alright, so, the issue, of course, is that if white takes the rook, black takes and, you know, kind of forks everything. So there isn't even time for, like, a desperado with, like, rook takes a5 check. Because if, uh, like, if white tries that, black will just take the knight in the end instead. So, overall, this was a very cool game, very interesting game. And, like, both players actually played quite accurately. It's just that uh, black played uh, a bit more accurately than white. Like, white had something like 92% accuracy, according to the Lee Chess engine, whereas black had 96%. And so overall, very fun game. I'm looking forward to covering more of the Move 7 sidelines. And if you liked what you saw, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Bye for now.